the basics of uh, where are we, who are you, where are we, and can you give us a tour? Okay, this is John Ottman. Uh, where are we? This is my house, and this is the, this is my office in my house, which is connected to my little studio. And um, there's really not a whole lot of function, function to this room except for uh, paying bills and uh, chatting on the Internet. <laughs> so that's what this room is for. And, um, and I uh, take a shower over here once in a while in the, uh, the bathroom. You go out here and chill out in the uh, little fountain area. Well, I was going to say, so in, in this uh, gentleman here, uh, he's from uh, Urban Legends 2. He was in the film for probably about three seconds. Uh, there was a, a spaceship set in these, uh, in the, the movies about film students shooting movies, and there was a, a spaceship set that the camera whips by really quickly, and um, we had such a li li limited budget. I was, uh, I was so cracked up by what the, uh, the costume lady did to whip this guy together that um, I took him home. And he's been in storage for five years, and his head turned brown because the rubber oxidized. But um, So anyways, he finally, you know, once I moved into the house, he got a place to stay. And you have a few awards up there as well. Uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. I never even see this stuff until someone like you walks in. <laughs> it's, it's, it makes me realize it's there. Um, this is the um, uh, this is the uh, BAFTA for Usual Suspects. This is the uh, two Saturn Awards, one's for Suspects, one's for um, Superman Returns. This is a Telly Award for advertising, advertising I did, and these are the BMI awards you get if the film you scored makes over a certain amount of box office money. So it has nothing to do with the art, it's just about uh, how much cash the movie made. But they're cool to get because it means that you get some good royalty checks. Um, and oh, this was a Lifetime Achievement Award already, uh, which was kind of scary in a way, um, f uh, that was done at some Temecula Film Festival. So what are those books? Well, these are sco bound, bound scores from, from the films that I've done, some of the films I've done. A lot of them are, a lot of stuff is here that wasn't bound. And, uh, but if you record in L.A., one of the fringe benefits is the uh, Joanne Kane Music or whoever your copyist is will nicely give you a score that's, that's got, uh, you know, that's like, a, it's like a book. Uh, same with, same uh, actually, um, I did the score in Seattle, which is the evil place for a lot of people in L.A., but they actually... Um, I did a bound copy for the Valkyrie score, so this is the uh, the score to Valkyrie here. Lots of rests. <laughs> are these like one-off editions? Yeah, well, you can have as many made as you want, uh, but um, you know, it, there's a there's a fee involved for them to prepare and, and take all the score and copy it and, and arrange it by cue order and um, make table of contents and so forth. But but then it makes it easy to reference if you do another film and you, you came up with some really cool brass effect or something and you want to reference it, then you can easily do that. Um, okay, I know you in the other room with a certain uh, Star Trek device that you like to get on camera. Uh, okay. Let us, let us sure. walk in. <laughs> it's actually more impressive at night when all the lights are out and the, the lights are on on the ship, but this is, uh, the Enterprise to me is one of the most beautiful things ever created by, by human beings. Uh, oh, okay, all right. I'm a, I'm a difficult cameraman. Okay, and part of my midlife crisis was... Um, I, I needed to have an Enterprise built because I'm a huge Star Trek fan, and uh, this 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 era of Enterprise was, uh, in, addition, in addition to the original Enterprise, it was, was the best. And I am I'm, I'm in uh, uh, a minority with a lot of Star Trek fans that grew up in Next Generation because I felt that ship looked like it been squashed in some sort of garbage compactor, and I hated that. So this was the the ship before they destroyed it. Um, anyway, so uh, I had the model made, and. Uh, no, no. This is based upon a DeBoer model kit, but 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 they would but um, they went in and drilled drilled all the um, the light holes and put all the uh, LEDs in and everything to give it the lights. And um, so there's there's uh, four different light switches here. One's for the the windows of the ship. This is when everyone's awake and doing their thing inside. <laughs> Okay, and then there's. So, so, but you're telling me that this is like a one-off edition. No, uh, well, no. I mean, this is the send it to this company, and uh, this guy that works for ILM uh, will build these for you on as, on his own. That's right. I just noticed the windows right there. Yeah, there's an arboretum in there, and then now I've got the uh, the spotlights on that light up the uh, the uh, the lights on the ship or the uh, the numbers, the license plate, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> And uh, there's the uh, shuttlecraft bay of the uh, coming in lights going on and the people in there. And then uh, there's another light which turns on the actual, if you pull back, turns on the warp engines. <laughs> and then um, 
And it looks great when all the lights are off and it's, it's not, not daytime. Um, there's also the officer's lounge in here. If you go in here, you can, you can see people standing there and sort of kicking back in the officer's lounge. A show, okay. All right. <laughs> and then, and then uh, you can shoot some photon torpedoes if you really want to geek out. Um, I actually rarely do that. It's kind of cheesy, but let's see. I think I push this button here. There it goes. Oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> I had the option of having the photon torpedo sound actually emulate from the, but I said, ah, that's all right. So, I'm, like, so I'm, I'm of course going to have to ask you, are you a fan? Do you think about buying the Master Replica one? Oh, the Master Replica, that's the the original Enterprise yes. from the from the original series. Um, I, I thought about it, and um, actually I didn't know about it until it was too late, until it was not available anymore. But um, I, yeah, I would have loved to have gotten it. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. But, but this, to me, Star Trek Notion Picture was... Uh, a very <laughs> uh, traumatic event for me because <laughs> Star Trek was you know, my entire identity, identity having grown up in the original series was at stake. Seeing this movie, I had no idea if they had made it like goofy or crazy, if, if they had kept the reality going. And and um, and uh, when this when the new Enterprise was revealed, as everyone knows, in this uh, very famous lengthy like 15 minute uh, fly around the Enterprise sequence, I was just you know dying. Uh, just it was I could watch that sequence over and over. Uh, most people were glazed over, but um, and then with Jerry Goldsmith's score and, and uh, introducing the, the, it was just uh, it was an orgasmic religious moment to see this ship revealed, and so this is this is that era of Enterprise. Uh, so real quick, because uh, I want to get in and start talking about uh, your scoring. Oh, well, we can let's start talking about Star Trek. <laughs> I was going to say, so what are your thoughts on the whole uh, uh, JJ reboot, and how do you feel about you know the reimagining? Well, I'm very jealous not to have been involved in any way, but um, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know much about it, frankly, except obviously it's, it's the younger version of Kirk and Spock and how they all came together. And um, I did um, get chills when I saw in the teaser uh, a brief moment of the, inter the original Enterprise being put together. Was, I guess guys were welding it, and I was like, oh, my God, there it is. It's, it's the first one, you know. But I really don't know nothing more about it. So I'm just, again, I'm, I'm hoping that it, it, stays, it stays real. And um, no matter how much fun it is, I hope it stays is plausible and because that to me is, is the best science fiction is if I can believe it really could happen the bedroom <laughs> now it ain't exactly Hans Zimmer's it's just uh, it's basically a bedroom converted into a, a padded room um, <laughs> yeah and there's uh, this is where I sit on my ass all day. This is left over from Valkyrie because Brian wanted a ch uh, his own special chair to preview the cues. Of the, the, the monitor was a little too high for him, so he wanted to be able to recline, so we had this chair shipped in. Um, and I was too, uh, I'm too super, I was too superstitious even after we recorded the score to get rid of the chair because I just knew that something would go wrong and we'd be back at some scoring session. So I kept the chair here just in case. But now it's here and I can't get rid of it. So, uh, How long did you guys actually uh, work on Valkyrie here? Um, he probably only came over maybe four times in, in the, or maybe five times in the uh, course of writing the score. I show I him large chunks. But... Um, but uh, yeah, and it's just it's just stayed there ever ever since. Um, right, yeah. I can't fit all the posters on the wall anymore, so I sort of exchange, I sort of um, rotate them and stuff. Um, and this is just a little recording booth for if I'm doing a solo or a solo instruments or a couple stuff. I want acoustic in my mock-ups and my there's my calendar that I always plot all all my cues. Um, and then this is again my no frills machine room. This is where all the the stuff is. I mean, the stuff used to be in the room itself, so I'd have to super cool the room, and it would be loud. You can even hear what I was writing because it all hums when it's all on. Um, I'm not working right now, so it's all off. Huh? Does everyone have a special air conditioning? And it has its own air conditioning, yeah. So it, it, its own separate climate control. And, um, yeah, and that's it. And um, so it's just a few Giga Studios and uh, computer. Okay, so uh, we're going to jump into talking about uh, Valkyrie. So uh, you've worked with Brian on all of his films except for the first X-Men. What was this process like, say, compared to some of the other films he's made? 
Uh, it was probably the one with the most agony. It was uh, supposed to be a short little gig, uh, seven months in, seven months out. These, that was the promise, and it turned into a year and a half. But it, it, the film was, was originally supposed to be a smaller movie, and it got, just got larger, especially when, uh, when Tom uh, got involved. It became a bigger movie. Um, but uh, it, it would, its rates as the most complicated and difficult movie to put together because it's not only a thriller suspense film like we've done in the past, but it's also one based upon a true story, and we hadn't done that before. So there's, there's only so much you can do to push uh, history uh, in the way you want it to be pushed uh, to make it more exciting. And so that, that was a, a challenge for me, cause, and very much like Usual Suspects, which is back to our roots, which is part of the titillation of, of doing this movie was the same writer and the same kind of thriller-esque kind of thing where there's lots of dense, intense dialogue in the enclosed locations. But that makes it very hard on the editor and the composer because they've got to make all those long-ass dialogue sequences in little enclosed locations seem, how, seem gripping somehow. And um, that's, that's just basically a sleight of hand with the, the editing and the music. So this one was very hard, and I couldn't, even though we, uh, I would shuffle... Uh, sequences and, and you know editorially to give to enhance their their suspense. Uh, there's only so far we can go because we also had to be very respectful of um, this very important true story. Um, uh, you mentioned to me that you were able to go to Germany for most of the shoot. No, it's, it's, thank you. Uh, you. You went to Germany for most of the shoot. Right. What was that experience like? Because uh, I I went to Berlin. I've been to Berlin and Munich, and I think Germany is a, a phenomenal place. It also has a very interesting nightlife. Um, were you able to go out at all? Uh, what was your experience like in Germany? And what was the, did you, how were the people when they knew what you were making? Like, what did you feel from the, the, the citizens there? Um, well, I'm, I was there for the whole shoot because the editor's got to be on from before they start shooting till after they're done shooting, and the, you know. Uh, but um, uh, the, the people were great. I mean, the, 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 ori the drama that I missed out on was the original drama when they were uh, originally a little, little reticent to, to cooperate, I think, on, in, the, in, the, um, in the powers that be there in Germany because of, of uh, well, this is their national hero, Klaus von Stoffberg, the characters Tom Cruise is playing. I think they were, they were immediately worried that we were going to do some Top Gun version of this very important uh, um, national story of theirs, and so, or, or this true event that happened about people who resisted Hitler. So uh, I think they were worried that they were, we were going to completely Hollywood, Hollywoodize this, this movie. When they realized we weren't, and when people actually read the script and we were doing a very reverential treatment of the story, they, they, they warmed up and they were very, very cooperative. And um, as for the nightlife... Uh, I, I don't understand <laughs> German nightlife or European nightlife because you know, I, I decided to go out one night and so I, I, got, I got myself ready and 11 o'clock I, I um, walked into the nightclub and you know, it's like, the, you know, people, the two people in the room look at you like, what are you doing here? You know, and I realized that, of course, they don't, you don't go out in Europe until like one in the morning. And uh, they literally get home at six or seven in the morning and they go to work or they don't work. And so um, there's a lot of unemployment in Berlin. I can see why since you know, they party all night long. But I, I didn't have the stamina. To, I felt very old. I, I, just, I can't go out that late. So um, I didn't see a whole lot of nightlife. And, uh, but the people were great. And um, the interesting thing about the city is that it's it's basically being built um everywhere you look is a is a crane you, you and I, I kid you not you cannot look in any one direction without at least having one or two cranes in your peripheral vision because it's they're just building this place so i always say well this place is going to look cool when it's done but um yeah but it was interesting it's always interesting to, to live somewhere else for a few months uh, in regards to every movie has deleted scenes every stuff gets cut right what were were there a lot of deleted scenes on this film? And if so, or whatever deleted scenes, were there one sequence you were sad to see gone? Um, there, you know, in this movie, unlike a lot of the others that we've done, there were just there's just pieces of scenes missing. There's not really any entire, excuse me, any entire sequences missing. Um, one of the one that was sort of sad to go and and displayed my complete objectivity as an editor and composer is, uh, is, a, is a waltz that um, Stauffenberg and his wife danced to in their living room. I, um, I wrote this piece with a friend of mine um, uh, to, for playback on the set. I didn't have a keyboard or my studio uh, in Germany, and I, and I didn't realize we 
I'd have to have this this original piece for them to dance to on the set. So I literally hummed this this tune to my friend with a phone because um, I didn't have any of my stuff with me. And um, so he did a rendering of it and sent it back, and that's what we um, we they danced to. And uh, it's basically when Tom comes home from his injuries and sees his family again, he dances with his wife. And it was a very, very touching scene, but, you know, in, collectively when you put something together, it was just sort of stalling the film. Um, so we cut it out. Uh, but we recorded the the waltz anyway, and I put it on the soundtrack album because it was just it sounded. I just knew it sounded really pretty with the orchestra. And and just in case we ever put with Valkyrie, you know, scenes are going in, out, in, out, in, out, or pieces of scenes in and out that you never know that the scene could have gone back in. And um, and at least uh, if we were to release it on the scene on DVD, then at least I would have had the music recorded with the orchestra. Um, as it turned out, we never we didn't put any deleted stuff on the CD on the, on the DVD. And other than that there was um yeah again just 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 a few lines and and um and stuff like that it was um you know there was some scene where Stoffberg cracks some joke on the top of a bridge before we go under the bridge where they're typing the valkyrie orders and and um for various reasons, we decided not to put the scene in. <laughs> you know, he, he, there's, there's, but the, that, that, was, that was really about it. Could you talk a little bit about writing the score for this? Yeah, I mean, from from moment one, we were all on the same page. A, the score should avoid any cliches with World War II. It shouldn't be a winds of war kind of score because it's a this movie's a thriller it's a suspense movie and um and so uh i purposely avoided any snare drums for the military you know all the obvious stuff and um did something that was a little um um more modern i guess for for this for this movie um uh and uh the, the biggest challenge was really to Again, the score the score became the pulse of the heartbeat of the movie, and how do you keep that pulse going without it overstaying its welcome and having the opposite effect of, of becoming a drone and actually creating a passive experience, which you can do if you've got too much music that just never stops. Um, so I, because I'm the editor and also uh, designed a lot of sound effects prior to dubbing the movie, I designed the score so I could I could intertwine it with the with the sound effects and have it ebb and flow and and have a drama to it and tell a story. Um, at least how I mixed it, and of course how I composed it too. Um, I had to compose it in such a way where, you know, uh, I could really plot out uh, where it's going. So it, it, it's so it could be telling its own story, uh, and then get away with being ever present all the time. And um, and then the other the third challenge was making the gradual transition from thriller to tragedy in the score without it being really noticed. Um. And so now I'm going, to, I'm going to switch subjects because uh, we've been talking for a little bit. I want to go into Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, okay. which is a movie that uh, I love and many people online love. And you did the score on that and worked right. with Shane Black. So okay, were you surprised at how popular that film ended up becoming? Well, I'm. I'm. Uh, it, it feels great when I hear you say things like that because I'm, I'm unaware that it really. I mean, I know it, it kind of got discovered, but um, I didn't know it's, it's, it became that popular, and that makes me feel great because it's. Uh, it's you know, oh, as anyone who knows it's watching this, it's a little gem of a movie, and and um, that's that film. I truly had a great time on. Uh, it was just. Um, you know, it wasn't tempt with anything, and they gave it to me. It was this low-budget thing. I think the whole movie cost like $8 million, and um, I just did my thing, uh, and I had a blast. And I think you could tell in the music that I was just really, um, I was really enjoying myself a lot. And um, uh, it's one of those films that you just see again and again. It gets better and better every time. And I, I admit the first time I saw it, I was a little... Um, confused and wasn't sure how to take it and I saw it again and I think by the third time because it was dry with any music or anything it was a rough cut but I realized this thing is hilarious you know so um, then I really got into it what was uh, Shane like to work with because Shane is known as being a little bit reclusive if you will yeah he was he was really easygoing and I love directors like that I mean you know it's a composer you can really if you have it if you have a director who lets you do your thing you can you can get lazy and um, get away with some crap but but um, for me um, I do the opposite I I am more inspired and work even harder when I have someone who just wants lets me do my thing and I really get into the film even more I feel re less restricted like I don't have this you know this this you know, 
iron fist over my head or something. So um, I, I think that he inspired me just by being so trusting. And um, yeah, he, he, and he, he created the funniest liner notes I've ever seen on an album. I don't know if you, if you read those liner notes. <laughs> because it was this psychoanalysis of me because he thought I hated the film. Um, and, and, and I and really, reading this, it enabled me to step back and look at myself and understand what I should do differently when I meet a director and look at their movie because I'm so worried and caught up when I see a film about what I'm going to do. I'm pre completely preoccupied by the task that I don't give enough accolades and say what I really think about the movie. And, and he really thought I hated it. And, and, he, and, he, and then he goes through this whole... Uh, analysis of, of my demeanor after like I like started working on the film and suddenly I it looked like I cared because and it's true I, I got excited because I cr I cracked the, what I thought the the sound of it score wise and um, yeah, it's very funny if you ever get to read his liner notes it's 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 all true. <laughs> That's a good time. Um, so you've worked with a number of directors, and, and you mentioned uh, how have, have any directors come at you with some like just really weird requests, or like tried to demonstrate the the sounds they want or the score, or are they pretty much just trusting in your ability? Uh, I, I you know I know it's had to have happened. It's, I you know anything that can happen that happens on these films, and then the, the most ludicrous suggestions you'll get, but uh, I, they're not coming to me at the moment. Um, usually the most ludicrous suggestions come from the, the that executive in the room that wants to justify his or her's, yeah, his or her's existence, and um, I, you know, they need to say something, and it usually makes absolutely no sense. And then the thing is, though, it will then cause some firestorm for nothing, you know, and um, um, but I, I can't really. Uh, I've never heard this before. This is <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I can't come up with an example right now, but believe me, they they do exist. Um, um, but but no, for the most part, you know, if if you are as a composer, if you can instill confidence or, or trust in, in 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 the people that that are working with you, and and explain in an eloquent enough way and an intellectual way why you feel. The music should be a certain way, as opposed to saying it has to be this way, and just that's the way it needs to be. Is uh, being defensive about it. There's two ways you can do it. If you really have a good enough reason that they, that, that it's coming from a way of enhancing the movie, they'll listen because they they desperately want the film to get better. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask the, the a question uh, for people out there who are want to be composers, people who want to get in the industry. Do you have any? Advice? Don't <laughs> get out. Get out. <laughs> if if you. Uh, I don't know if you can live on Tums or uh, you know Roll Aids and uh, Xanax, then then go for it. No, I'm sorry. What was the any any like any real suggestions for like people who might want to get in? Well, you you know, uh, in addition to having uh, you know knowledge of how to write music, um, you know, film music is a whole different animal. You know, you got to think outside the box. A, a lot of friends I know who went through the very classical route of, of learning music, you know, theory and all that sorts of stuff. Sometimes they're a little lost when they're scoring a movie because it's a totally different kind of art form. Um, it comes from a whole different part of the brain, different sensibility, although it's still writing music. So there, there's that. You try to unlearn what you've learned. Uh, it, yes, exactly. Um, and um, uh, I was trying to think of it. Never mind. Um, what was I going to say? Um, unlearn what you've learned. Um, and um, break break some rules because uh, you, you break a lot of rules in film music and 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 um, you know it's not that you should but um, it, it's that whole mindset. And then the other thing is um, I've lost you, your Yoda, Yoda thing totally threw me off. <laughs> um, um, the other thing is is you've got to be not only uh, the artist but you've got to be a diplomat. And if you're just a scatterbrained artist, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to. Succeed unless you've got some sort of right-hand person who can who can manage talk through you know you who you can talk through or something because you've also got to be a, a diplomat and a filmmaker to to sit there with them and then explain you know uh, and, and talk in an intellectual way about why the music should be the way it should be.